Okay, picture this, from living in a hole for nine months to escape persecution during the Holocaust, to owning companies like Karl Lagerfeld and Donna Karen in two generations. This is the story of our next guest. Morris Goldfarb, G3. You don't even know about G3, but you're probably wearing a piece of clothing right now without even knowing it that Morris either designed or manufactured. And this is an emotional one. I mean, Morris talks about the parting words his grandfather says to his father as his grandfather is being in a death camp, basically, and how the impact that's had on him throughout his life. And that impact has turned into ambition and incredible work ethic that has created this company called G3, a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company that owns so many of the brands you know and you love. I love this one. I learned how to survive, how to adapt. Morris takes us through some timeless lessons. It's a great one. It's a great Big Shot episode with an incredible story of an amazing Jewish entrepreneur. Morris Goldfarb, here we go. Here we go. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started from the bottom, now my whole team here. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Morris, when I start, um, DKNY, Carl Lagerfield, Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, Nautica, Major League Sports teams. Levi's. Levi's. So many others. But how, how does a as a son of a Holocaust survivor go from co the concentration camps to where you are today? Um, what was it like growing up with your dad and, and his experience coming out of, of the Holocaust? Um, and how did that sort of instill your ambition that you have right now? So going back, chronologically a yep. little bit. Um, my dad, who's a Holocaust survivor, uh, met my mother in a DP camp in Germany after the war. Uh, they married and moved to Israel. Um, I was born in Israel, uh, came to the States when I was six years old. Uh, my dad... Don't speak a word of Hebrew. Okay, great. Everybody concentrated on teaching me English. That's probably the right thing to do. Um, my parents, uh, you know, they're... Hebrew was their second language, it wasn't their primary language. So I speak Yiddish, happy to speak Yiddish with you, but Hebrew... Abyssal Yiddish. <laughs> yeah. Don't lose it. Yeah, I won't. So um, Aaron comes to New York in 1956. Um, no money, it's a classic story. He had a little bit of experience with leather as a kid. He was um, worked for a shoemaker for a little bit. For, for his meals and a warm coat every year, and um, found, uh, found his two brothers, two surviving brothers who uh, were in a leather business, and um, uh, another gentleman who happened to be the brother-in-law of uh, Aaron's brother. Mm -hmm. um, he was in <laughs> need of money and need of a partner, so Aaron wrote him a note for the investment, and um, they started a, a business called G&N Sportswear. Which is women's, initially. All women's jackets. Okay. And what year is this? Uh, this is 1956-57. Okay. Uh, they built a, a prosperous business. They did well. I didn't grow up as a hardship case. Okay. Aaron did. Right. Why jackets, though, and not shoes? I'm sorry? Why jackets, not shoes? I mean, he's a shoemaker, right? The luck of the draw, maybe the barrier to entry was easier and uh, buying sewing machines versus heavy equipment for shoes. Didn't need any money. You needed some sewing machines. You needed some leather that you bought in, in the marketplace, either you know, through distributors. You got a little bit of credit, so I would imagine. It was no, it, it didn't He's matter. It, it, it could have been, you know, paper towels. He needed to make a make living. Right. Was, was your dad entrepreneurial generally? Yeah, very much so. He always was. He always was. Always. Uh, yeah. After the war, you know, he would, he would trade in the black market in, in Germany. He always, always made money. Yeah, there was, uh, there was this sort of story that I sort of heard. That I'd love to hear in your words about when your father last saw his father in the concentration camps. He said something to him. Cool. <clears throat> so um, my dad had a book written about his life called Maybe You Will Survive, which are the final words that his dad... Maybe You Will Survive. Yeah. Wow. Um, those that's are the, the name words. of the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, that's the line that um, his father 
parted with as he was put on the train to the camps. He said, maybe you'll survive to him. <clears throat> so um, Aaron was put on the survivor line and um, survived and prospered. Uh, the, you know, it's an amazing American dream story. Um, um, I got the privilege of working with him for almost 20 years. Crazy. Um, and we shared an office, basically. He was pretty much retired early on. He, he fulfilled his dream. When we, when we read the line uh, out loud, uh, I believe it was something like, go, my son, maybe you will survive. Uh, you know, we all got goosebumps. Uh, it's, it's, just, it, it's something that there's almost no way to forget that after that's said to you, for, you know, by a father. Right. And um, it's an amazing thing to sort of put that type of responsibility. Your dad was a kid at the time. My dad was uh, 16, 17 years old. Yeah, I mean, and, and, he, and he went, and not only did he survive, but he thrived. Well, and how he survived, I mean, it's, it's worth, you know, could you tell us the story? I mean, we read it, but I'd you love read to- read it? Oh, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, he survived first in a work camp. It was in, the, he, he uh, was in a munitions uh, camp, uh, and he and two of his brothers, and a friend escaped um, and literally lived in the woods under a willow tree next to a Gestapo headquarter. Um, they dug a hole that was um, six feet deep and um, they, they, they hid. And how long they, would they be living, would they uh, have to live in almost this Almost a year, nine in, months. In, nine in this months hole. In a hole in the ground. Yeah. Not just in a hole in the ground, by a like, Gestapo. Yeah. Like on, on a like property, property owned by on the a property, um, and they would uh, they'd get out in the middle of the night and find food. There were you know there there were people that helped them along the way, people that he knew in the community uh, that were uh, willing to take a risk and give him a loaf of bread or or a piece of bread or wow. a potato or whatever. It was. And would those people have known where he was hiding? And no, he was careful not right. to. Disclose where he was hiding, uh, and he would spend a day or two um, on a farm of a neighbor that he knew, and uh, not even tell the neighbor that he was, you know, nearby. Although the neighbor did help him, didn't want to tell him that he was staying, you know, out in the, out in the field uh, because sure, Gestapo comes, away. and you know, they they would give him maybe give him away. There are many that did not. So it, it's an amazing story. It but it also build incredible hours. resilience. I'm I mean, sorry? The resilience of that, right? I mean, you, you know, you in the book, think... they talked about this idea of like survivor's instinct. And I think one of the reasons that potentially that your dad was so successful when he came, when he left the war was he'd built this resiliency that he's going to survive. He's going to figure it out. That, that's exactly him. He always figured it out. How, how did that? No in... formal education, uh, but he was as smart as hell. Yeah. Um, how would that have impacted you? I mean, do you remember the first time you learned about the Holocaust and what your father went through? Um, I probably learned about it from birth, but I really kind of recognized uh, what he was talking about when I was 15 or 16 years old. You know, I was busy growing up. I was busy playing baseball, right. and you know, uh, I had I had parents that had an accent, and you know, it wasn't. Uh, it, it wasn't something that you promoted. You, you almost shied away from the fact that your parents had an accent in, in a community. Um, and then when you, you, know, you mature uh, and you really recognize what they went through, it's, um, it was tough. Yeah. Excuse me. Of course. That means... As you can tell, it's still tough. Yeah, sure. of course. <clears throat> so, you know, he was very fast to talk about it. There, talk about his experience. Um, the 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 friends that uh, uh, he had gathered in New York were all Holocaust survivors. They all had a story. They, wow. It was not. It was not a unique. It wasn't unique. Was I mean, he was no. in the ground. His, his his 
His story, with his the way story he is unique, right. but they were they, they were all unique. Uh, some that would you know, just so he, he comes to New York with, more with so. pretty much nothing. I mean, not comes much. Comes to New York uh, with nothing, right, nothing, no money. And you said uh, you're the eldest. So you, have, you have some siblings. Like, I have a brother. You, so you and your brother both come when you're you're six at this point. My brother was born in New York. Okay, he was born here. So you come here. You're here. Your dad's sort of setting up this clothing company. Um, what, did he did he care about the clothing company, or was it was it a means to an end? Was it about food on the table? Well. <laughs> Let me regress a little bit. Please. When he came here, he worked as a laborer on the construction site first. Uh, then he uh, he uh, made a few dollars and bought a laundromat. Uh, those were not his dreams. Yeah. Owning a business was, and this came into play um, you know, with his two brothers. And um, I would say he had a, an amazing passion for it. He loved... Um, he loved the factory, loved um, the leather business as it evolved, um, and loved the people that he employed. And presumably he's it's working, alleged. like, there was no Friday night dinner where he's, because he's, he's probably um, working. No Friday night dinner. Uh, he was a hardworking guy. Uh, summers were probably not too different than uh, you all know. Uh, he worked during the week, and... You know, the classic uh, Monticello, upstate New York, bungalow colony was, you know, it was the trek for him. And my mother and I and my brother stayed there for yeah. the summer. And he'd commute weekends. So, um, loved sports. He was a well-rounded guy. Did he want you to go into the clothing business? Was no, he... he told me to get a city job and... Uh, not, a city job. Yeah, get a job working for the city. You get great benefits. You don't have to kill yourself. And, <laughs> it's a secure uh, job. Yeah, exactly. It's a secure benefits. job. Exactly. Good, yeah. good benefits. Yeah. You don't have to do this. Um, but um, he he knew that the city job was not going to be me. Young as uh, I was, I was aggressive as a kid. Um, aggressive how? I, I worked in a coffee shop. I worked in a shoe store. I was not a laid back um, young guy. Um, and um, um, as I got older, I, I did have an interest um, you know, in going into his business. Um, you know, holidays and every, every family gathering, um, you know, the talk at the table was the leather factory. Mm -hmm. I had two uncles in a business. And I had a father in the business. And what would they talk about at the dinner table? You know, they're common customers, they're common suppliers, and this isn't bad. So what was your, your first real impact on the business along the way of all these transformations? Um, my dad stepped aside very early. When I was 24 years old, I was running the company. And why did the he step first thing, um, wanted to enjoy his life. Okay. And had every right to... Right. Had all the money he wanted, all the money he needed. Wanted to travel with my mother and uh, okay. enjoy life. And then uh, kind of modified a little bit. Um, and he did stay on board for almost 20 years, you know, where we shared an office. And um, he was an amazing teacher. Um, you know, the... You probably got the, to know him in a different way. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and the... the you know, the fear and, and respect that I had for him as a kid evolved into something different. There was a different level of respect. It was more understanding of why, you know, it was the, the, the firmness in, in, in his grasp of the family existed and uh, uh, just understanding his choices. But you're 24, you're selling a Petri. Things are good. Things are good. Yeah. So what, what changes? I'm not going to sit back and run a moderate business that doesn't have a strategy of growing. So you're ambitious. I'm ambitious. So um, you know, you, you know, I, I made a a bunch of friends, most of them uh, emanating in you know, relationships through the leather business uh, that were Wharton grads that ran businesses and. Minnesota that um, uh, had different investments and different different sites for the future. Uh, I was I was a kid in the group. I was ten years younger than you know, my 
my contemporaries in business, um, and they were they were selling, they were buying, they were you know it wasn't wasn't necessarily the leather business. Uh, turned out that's where it started, uh, but. Um, I guess uh, you know, the biggest impact uh, was, uh, um, you know, the company called Berman's, uh, which you probably have no reason to know, but it evolved into a company called Wilson's. One, Berman's was owned by W.R. Grace. Wilson's was owned by Melville, which today is CVS Drug. Um, these guys... One ran um, Berman's, one ran Wilson's, both from Minnesota. Ah. We became the best of friends. Uh, and as their business evolved into, both their businesses evolved into uh, an import business because the creativity couldn't be serviced out of New Minnesota. York, Minnesota. <laughs> um, I traveled uh, with them pretty much as a consultant in, in the early stages of development. Um, and we opened factories. Uh, either, uh, either they were opened for for Wilson's Bermans, uh, or for myself, starting out in South Korea. This is 1978, which is early for. So you're a consultant cycle. for them. Cons yes, I ran a factory. Right. I, I knew how to I knew what was re right. What was required. And during the man, and I was. We were best friends. Right. And during the mandate, you're like, hmm, maybe I'll open factories in South Korea too. Exactly. Uh, I came back later, and you know, we we opened uh, our own factories, our own offices. What was the opportunity you saw there? I mean, why why South Korea? Why? I mean, you're making at home. It, things are going well. There are limitations in what you could create and what you could manage to you know to create in talent, um, and in. Um, Southeast Asia, we'll use Korea as really the foundation that uh, South Korea was really the foundation. You had a, an eager population uh, that needed employment and you had trading companies like Samsung, uh, Sankyung, um, Lucky Gold Store. You had eight uh, trading companies that were uh, sponsored by the government to you know, generate cash. Mm -hmm. Um, and they didn't know how to say no. Their their mission in life was yes, you know, to develop Korea, uh, and we were part of that. Um, they were amazing partners. They helped fund our business. Uh, they helped produce, and they not helped. They did produce, they produce. pretty much all our needs. Um, and eventually, I, I closed the New York factory. Uh, that was, you know, that was my dad's heart and soul, quite honestly. The New York factory and the the, the people that worked for him uh, were his reason for going to work. Uh, and hated you, South Korea. How did, how, did hated, he, how did he feel about that? Hated it. He hated it. He hated, he hated the idea. Hated the idea of importing. Um, you know, just uh, the evolution of that would be. We would close the factory. We would put these people out of work, um, and it's not something that he sponsored. That was probably the only only disagreement we ever had in sure. business. Because you had a vision for where you can take this. He, I, I'm sure he appreciated the vision, but for him, I suspect the people working the factory they're almost like a family to him. They were, um, and it took a while to 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 bring an emerging country. And and, and when I created a foothold in. Um, in South Korea, I think it was like 1984. Uh, it was early in their development, and um, there's there's a training period. Yeah. Uh, your quality is not developed yet. Uh, there are problems, and you know, lucky for me, every time a container came in, the first garment he grabbed was a problem garment. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Told you, um, yeah. it's crap. Like, it's Dad, crap. there's yeah. 999 more, Bob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for all you know, he called them up and said, "Make sure you put the defects <laughs> at the front of the gate." Yeah, but at this point, I'd roll my eyes the moment he walked over to a you're... garment. I said, "He's going to pick the one." <laughs> totally. <laughs> you're still making for your own brand for Petri stores, or at this point, you've started. Yeah, we to... we went beyond that. The the Petri. Cycle, you know, they were an incredibly important account, you know, and, uh, through through their existence. I, I think they shut down in maybe 1991, 92. 
95, actually, pretty much it was an era where everything in specialty retail kind of faded away. And um, Petri stores finally shut its doors. So at this point, um, where do you shift? I mean, it's 1984. We, we we're everywhere. Okay, so we, you're, you're producing you're, for anyone that needs production. Yes, I now had significant production. I took our company public in 1989. Why'd you do that? My two buddies in Minnesota um, and myself, we, we, we would create in those days what was called the blind pool, which is you know, today's SPAC. SPAC. Yeah. Yeah. So the first blind pool was, was called Anticorp. Uh, Anti because um, the senior partner, uh, one of the country's biggest gamblers, uh, started the World Poker Tour, opened casinos, the leather guy from Berman's. Um, and so we named we named it Anti One. Anti One was uh, Anti Corp was running out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, either you know, we had to distribute mm -hmm. the the cash, yeah, or or, or, invest. or invest. And the decision was to fold G three into into Anti Corp. So we backed into a blind pool to become public. And six months later, we did an offering with Oppenheimer. Uh, wow. So, um, and it wasn't, it, we were a nice sized company. By that time, we were almost a hundred million dollar company doing no longer women's leather jackets. Our claim to fame when we went pu public was uh, the Top Gun jacket, uh, that brown aviator with, jacket with, with, with an patches. app lining yeah. and the yeah, patches. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. So that was 90% of our business was one jacket, one skew, one skew. Four wow. sizes, one color. That must wow. have kept you up at night a little bit. <laughs> it kept me up at night when I did a road show throughout the world trying to market the company. I said, somebody out there is going to be smart enough to say, what percentage of your business is <laughs> yeah, one, jacket? <laughs> one jacket? Nobody ever asked. You know what I, <laughs> your, your competitive advantage at this point is that you were early on in offshore manufacturing, right? So, you, so you're, you'll make anything for anyone at this point. You just need to use the factory. Don't make me that callous. There is, <laughs> no, not callous. There, there, there is an art to this. Smart. I mean, yeah. of no, course, yeah. But I mean, you know, considering now, you know, you're sort of like the king of brands. There's no brands at this point. No brands. Right. Uh, what and we you, did is exactly. we... we we utilized G3 for Bloomingdale's as well as um, J.C. Penney. Right. Uh, and if there was a truck stop that was carrying leather jackets, I would sell the truck stop. I was, they, I was not protecting a brand that was generating income. Um, and the tougher business got, the broader distribution had to be. And at one point, I destroyed the brand. Uh, we were we were done shipping G3. Uh, There's nothing I could do to save it. So we sat um, as call it a steering committee um, and said, "Well, what do we do now? Um, the the bomber jacket is gone. You know, we've destroyed it. We've brought it down to the lowest possible denominator sure. in quality, and then uh, so that's done." Uh, our accounts in 1995, the bulk of our accounts went into bankruptcy. Some unique reason, some COVID hit uh, you know these, mm -hmm. this entire sector. So it was Petri stores, uh, Edison Brothers, Merry-Go-Round, uh, Learner Shops, uh, a bunch of the uh, limited divisions. They all went out in 1995, and that was my world. We did not have a department store business. We did not really have a Walmart business. So we sat and said, okay, what do we do now? So we said, uh, we know how to produce. We know how to source. We have an amazing overseas structure. So we said, uh, there's some brands out there that are doing a nice job. Maybe we ought to start licensing. And it was not, there was no Jamie Salter. There was no... Yeah. IP entity. Uh, they so were all we owned. Went, they were all owned by the actual. By the actual. You know, Tommy we, Hilfiger owned Tommy Hilfiger and and, and Ralph Lauren. Yeah, right. So, but the the early stage of licensing was beginning. So, we chose three brands. We chose Nine West, which was privately held. It was owned by Vince Camuto. Uh Kenneth Cole, uh, at the time privately held. Um, and then uh, Kenneth might not have been privately mm -hmm. held at that time, and Colhan. And we took Colhan for Saks, 
uh, Sax Bergdorf's, not Bergdorf's, uh, Sax Neiman's, uh, Nordstrom's, and Bloomingdale's. When you say you took them, meaning yeah. you got exclusivity we, for those retailers? Or you, you had the license we, for those retailers? We, it was their early stage, and we, we co created uh, so what would, the distribution should be, uh, their footwear sat in those stores. Yeah. So we chose Kohan for the top tier. Nine West went to, at the time there was May Company before it was acquired by Macy's. Mm -hmm. So Nine West was for uh, May Company and, and it, its universe of retailers. And uh, Macy's became Kenneth Cole. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we had three brands, three separate management teams running the brand. What I did not want is you know the brands to look homogenous because in some cases they sit on the same floor, sitting next to each other, and you really want a different personality. Sure. When brand. you say we chose, uh, isn't this is coming off the heels of losing ninety percent of your revenue, right? We went from a three hundred million dollar business to one hundred and twenty. Wow! Uh, Almost overnight. Literally overnight. Did, were you at risk of going bankrupt? No, we, we had virtually no debt. Uh, we did have uh, a bank group that was accustomed to, to, to a pay down of our debt annually mm -hmm. for and staying clean for 90 days. Mm -hmm. So that didn't happen that year. Um, and we, uh, uh, we were, I guess you'd say we were in default of the loan, which was not a very big loan. So, uh, and one of the trading companies in Korea basically stepped up, unsolicited, uh, SK Global, and um, uh, underwrote uh, a loan for $25 million in 1994-95 in money. That was, you know, that was a, that was they a called money. you to, to, to do this. Yeah, well, they didn't want, they didn't want you to right. leave their factories. They wanted you to continue. We, we developed a, you know, we, we developed a, a close relationship. The, the founder's son was uh, just a, a great friend. Um, and, you know, there was no shortage of money at uh, SK Global. And they, and they wow. just said, as long as I was a CEO, that they would give it to you. They would give it to the bank. Morris, I, I, you know, my history is in a family business, and I watched them all stop talking to each other, which is not uncommon in Jewish family businesses. You guys have managed to keep this going uh, and thrived. What are some of the challenges of running a family business? Have you have you done that? So this big shot thing is super fun. We're having a great time. People are loving it. Um, it's a little expensive, <laughs> just to say it. Like, you know, at the end of the day, we are, you know. I'm glad you said we're, it. We're still stingy <laughs> Jews here. Like, like it's it's really quite expensive. And you and I are funding this whole thing ourselves. It's not so cheap. I, I think, I think the, the, at the very least, we should at least promote our yeah. tea business. You all see the production quality. The I mean, production quality is incredible. Yeah. We have an amazing staff, yeah. tons of producers, and it's a little expensive. Yeah. So I'm obsessed with tea. I built David's Tea. I left many years ago. Um, and Harley actually- I can't believe we're doing me. this, this is perfect. We're this doing this because, because you know, we have great tea, but we also, we gotta pay for Big Shot. <laughs> perfect. So Harley got me back into tea. I would curate these green tea collections for you. You're having trouble sleeping yeah. in the evenings. I'm like, oh, you gotta drink, switch coffee. You don't need 10 coffees well, a day. Been, well, I mean, if we're gonna tell the story, let's tell the story. Yeah, right. I had been drinking so much during the pandemic. I was by myself, obviously, like the rest of us were, and I was drinking a ton of coffee. And my anxiety was peaking. And actually, you had said you should switch off of coffee in the afternoon and move to really high quality green tea. It, it, the caffeine and green tea interacts differently. You don't get the big spike and crash. It's like a calm alertness almost, a right? calm alertness, yeah. and, and green tea's amazing, like really high quality green tea, and then... But frankly, like most people, I'd never yeah. had high quality green tea. Most of the tea that I had consumed in my life, it was it was like in a gift, like I'd give a right. talk somewhere and they'd give me a gift box or some sort of gift package and there'd be some like random tea right. bags in there. But I'd never actually had really high in green yeah. tea. So you very kindly started curating this box of incredibly high-end, amazing green tea. And you also began to sort of, you know, jerry-rig these accessories for me. You'd say, drop it in here for three minutes and then take it out, make sure it's not steaming. And you just created this incredible tea setup for me. In fact, you know this, but next to my, my home office, I now have a little tea area that you actually created for me. Right. But green tea in particular and, and, and having you curate this tea for me was this incredible new element of my life because it allowed me to stay really energized, really focused in the afternoon without having any issue with sleeping. 
And that was the inspiration for Firebelly. Finally, I was like, you're like, you know, let's do it. I'll be your partner. So we started Firebelly Tea. Most people want to take a tea bag and dunk it in the water. And the reality is there's this rich experience you can get with tea where, where you take the time to make it properly, whether it's green tea, black tea, oolong tea, herbal teas. Um, we're doing something special with Firebelly. Yeah, so Firebelly is the, the, the highest, the, the best tea, and actually you got a chance to design every single accessory yourself. Absolutely. You went ahead and figured out, this is the best teacup, this is the best strainer for it, this is the best whisk in terms of how to make great matcha, but this is the best tea and the best tea products ever, and uh, please buy our tea. We need a way to pay for more Big Shot episodes, so we don't, you, need, we don't need your money, but we do. We would appreciate you buying some amazing green tea from Firebelly Tea, Dot com. It is not just a pitch, it is also the greatest tea ever, and it would make us really happy. If you don't like it, we'll give you your money back. No, no, we're not, we're not giving the money back. Why not? You're not giving, we're keeping you're your money, love it. but you're gonna love it. You're, you're gonna giving, love it. All of a sudden, you're such a big shot, you're giving people's money back. Don't give away, don't give or the money back. Or you'll give it, you'll give it as a gift. It makes a great gift. It's a great gift, it's great tea, it's great accessories. You actually will really, really love it, and allow us to pay for more of these Big Shot episodes. Um, so that's our that's our pitch, and uh, all of you must be laughing uh, wherever you're sitting right now watching this. We don't care. We have. We actually know tea well, though. We know. I mean, we also know e-commerce well too. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. So we know e-commerce. We know tea. Firebelly tea. Go buy some. Help us pay for more Big Shot episodes. <laughs> so I know our audience. I know our answer. They're going to say, yeah, we, 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 we love your tea. We want to <laughs> buy from you. We want to support Big Shot. Is there a coupon code? Like, I'm going to get my aunt or someone in my family is going to call me and be like, I love the tea. It's really great. Can I get a discount? So is there a code we can give them? Uh, Big Shot 15. F Big Shot 15. Okay. Big Shot Use 15. code Big Shot 15 for 15% off our tea and tea accessories. And if you don't like the tea and you don't like the accessories, David will give you your money back. I will not. He will. <laughs> That's it. I'll give you your money back. Okay. I got you. All right. I won't. <laughs> um, it's not a family business any longer. It's true. It's a publicly a held company, and yeah. I, I own barely ten percent of the company. It's not. You know, right. But, but it's run. It, was, it, it it is run as if it was uh, a privately held company. Um, I um, I walked around today with. Uh, a potential new client, very interesting uh, meeting throughout. And it was everywhere we, we stopped, we have 30 floors in the building. Uh, and we didn't go to 30 floors. Let's say we went to six. Mm -hmm. You'd randomly stop somebody and say, how long are you working here? And say, 20 years, 25 years, 45 years. Wow. Um, and that that's the difference. You guys view the family as everyone. The family is really everyone. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, the the tenure of our leadership is. Uh, I don't. I don't think there's a company like it. You know, this is an industry that people leave for. You know, a, a small raise, and I, and I understand that. Uh, there's a loyalty that's different at G3. I think so. Yeah. Did your dad, when you came in? Uh, treat you as one of the rest of the extended family, meaning meaning you know the employees who had been there a long tenor. Well, it sounds like there was no nepotism, right, with your dad. I I made sure there wasn't. Yeah. Um, I didn't commute with him. I came. Really? If that he, was important it, to you. It was important to me. Yeah. Um, uh, I didn't want to be given a salary. I wanted to earn it, and I was creative on how I earned it. Um, I'd pick up leather scraps. I made a deal with, you know, my dad and his partner. When I first came in, I saw these scraps on the floor that you can make keychains out of. And so, what do you do with that? I said, well, you throw it out. I said, well, why don't you sell it to the findings guy? He said, because the guy that's going to pick it up is going to throw a skin in there, and we're going to lose more on shrinkage than it's worth. I said, do you trust me? He said, yes. I said, I'll do it. And so uh, I picked up income through throwing out debris. Right. Um, the, I was creative on how I earned it, um, and I made sure that I earned it. Yeah. I was, I was in, as early as my dad came in, I came in a half hour before. That's right. um, if he left at 4 o'clock and asked me if I wanted a ride, I'd... I got work to do. I'm staying here. I'm staying here. Yeah. So how, how do you go then from like, you know, Nine West and Kenneth Cole to where you're licensing these deals to actually owning companies like, like you, you, you own Carl Lagerfeld, you own DKNY and Donna Karen. How does that transition happen? So it, it happens um, with uh, adding complexity to your life. Every, every step you make necessitates another step. Sure. 
So we, um, we made a few acquisitions. Um, one of the better ones, you know, the best one we made was uh, um, a company that had the rights to Calvin Klein coats, women's coats with a potential license for men's coats. So when we acquired that, we uh, began to build a relationship. Uh, the guy that owned that company um, had a relationship with PVH. Um, and Huge conglomerate, massive company. Very significant conglomerate doing nothing in the women's business. We, we created the women's business for Calvin Klein. It wow. was a men's brand. So we, uh, uh, we uh, as we developed the coat business, we said, you know what? You know we're we're still postured as a seasonal business. You know every meeting you know, with with an investor is well. What do you do the other nine months? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we we take modified risks. We cut inventory. We we, we do stuff, uh, but we don't generate you know very much on the sales side. So uh, we went to PVH and asked for several categories. They were kind enough to give it to us. We succeeded, um, and the rest is kind of history. And as we succeeded with Calvin Klein, they said, well, let's take the template that we created for the coat business, mm -hmm. which is multiple licenses addressing multiple retailers, and create the same thing on the dress side of the business, suit separates, uh, athleisure, denim, so we, we created uh, multiple brands through licenses mm -hmm. um, for multiple categories. And as uh, you know, your question relates to acquisitions, mm -hmm. yeah. as a balance sheet uh, got better and we had a meeting, the, the future of our company, G3, uh, appeared to be a, a sale of the company to PVH. Mm -hmm. We were the women's side. We had great relationships with management, pretty much in time. And they already own the men's side, so adding you makes a lot of sense. Right. And we had and conversations that, re you know, they were much bigger. Uh, there was a, a trust factor. We had uh, meetings that related to you know, the merger of our company into theirs. And uh, one of the meetings, uh, their CEO says, uh, Morris, you know, the value of our brand is equal to you know, your your earnings. You know, it's like you know, our brand in your portfolio is worth uh, mm -hmm. a half a billion dollars. You got to give us credit for that if we got to buy. If we've got to buy you, he says basically, Morris, you don't have any chips. So I went home and I said, right. got to get some chips. So we uh, got in touch with LVMH. Um, built a nice relationship with them, and on a second effort, first effort failed, uh, and second effort we we bought uh, uh, DKNY and uh, Donna Karen from them, and they don't typically sell assets. They never sell assets. So uh, the Bernard Arno agreed to sell me the you know, the company, um, and then. Um, Carl Lagerfeld, we tried to buy the entire company. We succeeded in buying 50% of North America and 20% of the globe. Um, and a year and a half ago, we bought you know the rest of what was left wow. over. Because uh, just so we understand this, up until this point, your model, your secret sauce is, when we say licensing, you would come in, to, whether it's Levi's or Guess or Calvin Klein or whoever, and you're like, look, you keep your brand. We're gonna make, we're specialists in coats or we're specialists in, in shirts or whatever segment you're in. We're gonna make for you, we're gonna design with you, we're gonna make the stuff, and then we're also gonna handle the relationship with the retailer, and we're gonna do it up market and down market. Do I have it right? Sort of, in modified form. Basically, we were good enough where we didn't need guidance as to what to design. Right. Uh, we didn't need governance on quality. We so had, Calvin Klein's not designing at a certain point for Calvin never Klein. Designed. No, yeah. Never, yeah. Yeah. never. We, we're self-sufficient. Uh, the, wow. account, the account relationships are ours. Yeah. So what do they do? They, I mean, they collect a royalty. Yeah. Wow. They collect a royalty as soon as... Nice to have chips. Well, nice to own the brand. <laughs> yeah, that's which, which, I mean, which is yeah. why, actually, I think you know when you talk about Carl Lagerfeld, for example, or DK and Wire, Donna Karen, you owning it means you own the chips yourself. 
And we collect the revenue and you, for a license. And you can license it yourself. And eyewear and right. How did they figure out though? Because presumably at some point they did everything you were doing. Who who figured out, hey, we don't have to do any work anymore. We can just have somebody else come in, do all the work, and we're just gonna collect a check. Well, the inverse has just happened. We've done this for twenty years mm -hmm. and built the largest women's apparel brand in the department store sector with Calvin Klein. New CEO comes in and says Hey, we can do that. Mm -hmm. They can't, um, but they chose not to renew our license. So we're not we're not going forward with Calvin Klein. They're doing Tommy. it themselves. They're doing it themselves. They're bringing they it all back in house. They, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Now what um, what they likely will realize is that designing is for women's is different than men's. They're going to realize that selling to retailers is a completely different thing than selling direct. What What do you think about? this whole idea of direct to consumer as a business model because one of the things also that's happened in the last 15 years is that you know in many ways the internet and i'm, I'm a part of this uh i spent a lot of time thinking about is sort of democratized distribution how do you think about that um <laughs> uh the 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 problem with that is if you control your own destiny um and you're not you're you're not Amazon. Yep. Um, um, we Amazon is a large customer. Um, so is Zalando. Mm -hmm. So is Macy's Digital. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, so not is, as licensing agreements. Just you you'll make for them. We we'll, we will sell to them. We make for us. Yeah. We will will sell our product and right. our brands to them. Right. Um, and it's a large business with pretty much every one of them. Uh, the the department store business, Macy's business, uh, at one time was about thirty five percent of you know, our total sales to Macy's. It was you know they're they're digital and um, it's a it's a large business mm -hmm. that um, when a consumer gets online and something is promoted, if you're a pure play, you're not you're not a brand that permits you know just spontaneous uh, marketing to to move product you're kind of okay uh, but if you're a flash sale and or or your your prices change on on a given Monday um, your consumer loses a little bit of credibility right. and and the and brand the, then the, changes the brand begins to change sure. yeah so we're we're a little bit cautious of it and yeah. we're becoming a little bit more uh, and through licensing you're when you license a brand you're a little bit less concerned about what what the ultimate damage is to to the brand as long right. as you've got you don't own the brand yeah don't own it uh and you own I guess, the inventory i guess your 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 born child you know might be a little bit more valuable to you than the adopted one would you would you prefer if you could if you look across all your portfolio brands there's dozens of them would you prefer to own most of them if you could um, or in some cases, the licensing. Some cases, uh, we're we're pretty much where we fit. Okay. Yeah, you know, there we own some great stuff. We own a, a swim brand that you probably Verbalquin. wear. Okay. Vilbrekan yeah. is is I awesome. My, my favorite. There you go. Yeah. So I liked uh, on your website, by the way. There's a toggle licensor owned and stuff, and so it's a really interesting way to sort of see the business model. So you know the 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 values that that you're given on Wall Street for ownership are different. The multiple you trade at is different than if you license. Right. Yeah. So you know we're seeing a little bit of that. Uh, we we're not getting the full benefit because we're going through a transition with PVH. Yeah. But as soon as everything you know stabilizes, I think we're we're on the road to becoming that. a different company. Yeah. How I mean it must be a big part of your business. The, you I believe you produce for all the sports leagues, the main ones, plus 150 colleges. How did, how'd you get that? Um, do you know who Carl Banks is? Carl, Carl is um, a football, he was a football player, played for the Giants, um, uh, incredibly you know, talented athlete. Um, he's got three Super Bowl rings, one of which I have. Um, he, um, he was granted in, in, in the 80s, the leagues would look out for their athletes. So after you get your head beat in for like <laughs> six or eight years, um, they kind of gave you the opportunity to license a category and create income for yourself. Wow. 
So Carl, for your for your for your own jersey or for the league? No, for for a category for within cate- the league. Wow. So Carl had big and tall men's leather jackets. Okay. So where do you go to to try to get a partner to do hey, a leather you to, jacket? You go to Morris. You, you come to us. So in 1985, Carl came to uh, came to me um, with his agent. This is a classic story. I love the story. Uh, he came with his agent and his lawyer and thought he had a pot of gold. Um, we sat for a little while. We were a small company. I think we were a twenty million dollar company in, in 1984, 85. And um, I told Carl, "You ever want to do a deal? Get rid of the agent, get rid of the lawyer, and come up. We'll have a cup of coffee." Uh, which is exactly what he did two weeks later. Wow! And on a handshake, we took on the challenge of doing big and tall men's leather jackets. Carl, um, Carl made a percentage deal with me, and for the better part of a decade, I don't think he made any money. Um, but why is that? We weren't doing anything. Oh, you weren't business. selling anything. Okay. And Carl built um, the business to uh, to a sizable business by getting more categories in all the leagues. This is after and the first probably. decade of making nothing. He finally starts to. We started to make uh, money. I, I guess you know, maybe it wasn't a decade. Maybe it was a half a decade. Right. Maybe it was maybe it was five or six years. Um, and um, uh, we've been doing this uh, since. The mid '80s. Wow, and he's, he's and he's your partner in that category. In that he, he gets a percentage of the sales. Okay. He yeah. he um, he's there every day. He drives the business. He's a, wow. I asked a mutual friend of ours, uh, Jamie Salter, uh, just before the interview. Tell me about Morris. You've worked with Jamie for a while. Jamie says you know he really admires you, looks up to you as a as a friend and and and, and role model mentor. But when I asked him about business, he immediately said, "Well, that's interesting. But what's more interesting." is Morris's relationship with his wife and his children and his grandchildren. You're a, I mean, you don't have to say this, but I'll say this. I mean, you're a business titan. You built this empire of a, of a company and you keep building. For me to ask one of your business associates about you in business and for them to say immediately, well, wait a second, he's great in business, but what you really should ask him about is his relationships with his wife and his children, and his grandchildren. His family. It's kind of unbelievable. And one of the themes that we're picking up from this sort of big shot project is behind all these big shots is someone in their life, a support system with family that allows them to operate at this incredible level of execution. How do you think about balancing all these things? Your family, being a great parent, great grandparent. How does that work for you? It's very difficult. Uh, my immediate family, absolutely great. It, it's It's... And it's not all of what it appears to be. My brother and I are on different planets. Uh, my children, my my wife, um, different. They're you know we're we're closely bound. Uh, my son has an office next door to me. He's worked with me for almost twenty three years. Wow. Um, and there's there's a mutual respect. Uh, there's no, there's no favoritism. You asked me how, you know, my father, you asked me how my father treated me. Was I, uh, was there nepotism? You can't help but have nepotism, but, um, my son was treated the same way. My son went to law school. I forced it. His first job in the company was the shipping department. It was this, you know, smartest guy in the shipping department. Mm -hmm. He knew how to pack a box like (laughs) <laughs> like nobody. Uh, his next job was uh, going overseas and understanding the import side of what we do. The next job was running a, a women's suit division for Calvin Klein. So um, he learned pretty much the same way I did. And he probably had it tougher than I did because we were, uh, as a small company, you get a grasp of all, all the small pieces easily. Uh, as a larger company, it becomes more complex. Uh, but uh, there's uh, there's a mutual respect, you know, between my kids and myself. My daughter's got uh, a beautiful life in Miami with a successful husband <clears throat> and great kids. And Jeff, I know what he does. I see him see him every day, and is is built a beautiful family. 
Uh, and my wife, I, I guess, is, is... You married for 50 years, you said? Uh, 52, oh, 52 years uh, it'll be this year, and five years of dating before we got married. So it's been a lifetime, uh, and it's yes. a good lifetime. It's a, um, it's an amazing story. You know, we have multiple homes. Uh, we, you know, we travel as a family. We have a home in, in the Caribbean, you know, that uh, our children come to the, religiously during Christmas, New Year's, and use it whenever they want. Is there a separation? I mean, you work with your son. Is, is it, how do you find that separation between your son, your partner in the business, your colleague, your your uh, report in some cases versus your son, your son? How do you how do you sort of balance those two? I'm not sure it's an intentional balance, but there's an evolution that uh, we understand where we are on, on the given problem or the given situation. But one doesn't bleed into the other. Right. Um, um, where I, I think we're both cautious of that, um, and of the relation of the the relation, the separation of right. you know what what's important in family and what's important in business. Right. Uh, so um, there's uh, um, there's a good balance. I think I think we both handle it pretty well. You know, and there's. Again, it's 23 years. Yeah, you, you've, you been figured out, you've, it out. you've been at it for a while. Yeah, we've been doing it a while, and I, I guess growing up in a family business taught me some. I'm curious also about how you feel like brands are evolving. I mean, it feels like today, like, if you don't necessarily have a strong brand attached to that piece, that garment, that piece of clothing, that jacket, the, the pair of sneakers, um, it doesn't really matter as much. as uh, like, it, like, you're not really going to be able to sell it in the way that you You're not want able to. to sell it? Yeah. Uh, different, you know. There, has that changed? You know, there, there's a hunt by retailers to find unique brands that that um, um, speak differently to the consumer. You know, we we're um, we're bulk sales. We're we're not going to do well in a small boutique yep. brand. Yep. Uh, you know, you need um, you need high margin. You need you need unique customers to be able to sell it uh, where uh, we sell well-designed good quality product at, at, at just an amazing price um, if you're uh, if you're looking for emerging brands we're kind of the wrong place to go we respect them we like to breed them in most cases we don't succeed with them yeah. we have a couple in our portfolio oh you see so you, you know, do try to create them from scratch sure. yeah. you know, we, we do yeah. um, you know, it's it's hard work yeah. um, it's it's easier lifting when you have a, a broad audience you have a customer that has 500 doors that wants to support your brand yeah. versus you know, a little boutique in Atlanta that you know, loves your product and is going to be loyal to it and right. buy By 24 pieces, yeah. you know, three you're in the course scale, of the year. If you're in the scale business, you yeah. know, it's very difficult to do yeah. that. I want to ask about, just to sort of finish up here, I want to ask a little bit about um, one of the themes that comes up across all the interviews. There's two things I actually want to ask. One is, um, when did you know that you made it? When I made it? Yeah. yeah. And the second is, what chutzpah means to you? <clears throat> Let's start with the first one. So I think I knew when I made it um, when we developed the aviator jacket um, in you know, late 80s into the 90s, um, the period of time that uh, we took our company public. I, I uh, got rid of all our debt um, and... Um, I had enough money to choose my preferences wow. um, and live live a lifestyle that uh, I dreamt of living. Right. Uh, and my wife and I, are, you know, we we have a good life. We we've always had a good life. Uh, but I, I think that period of time was okay. Now what? Um, and um, I chose to continue to develop it there was you know the there was an open invitation you know we we hadn't maxed out on our our talent our capital um and um i've um i at that period of time i was making a significant amount of outside investments 
which I guess secured my feeling that I, I didn't have a high dependency on on the Shmata business or the aviator <laughs> yeah. jacket. Uh, didn't know that I would develop uh, a conglomerate of an apparel company. And what does chutzpah mean to you, Morris? Um, chutzpah is um, basically having the nerve to do what you believe is r the right thing to do uh, and not uh, not not being uh, not being persecuted by uh, a demand or um, uh, or um, a, a hard request from somebody that is a must do. Stand um, stand up for what you believe. That's right. One last thing, you know, sadaka giving back is such a central theme in the Jewish culture. How do you think about philanthropy? It's important to us. Um, historically, um, Arlene, my wife, has uh, been very active in Jewish causes, uh, and um, we created, you know, the first thing we did when we took our company public and I had, uh, had a little bit of money is uh, uh, dedicate a fund that uh, gave our community and our synagogue um, a, an annual trip to the Holocaust Museum you know, every Every graduating class could absolutely go on, uh, and we we uh, were private about our givings. Uh, so why is that? Why, do you, why is that important? Just your style? Just just our style. Yeah. Um, we um, uh, we just finished uh, uh, a mission in um, in Poland. We um, my wife and I found the. Um, uh, the Jewish cemetery in my dad's hometown about 10 years ago. Um, by coincidence, we happened to go visit Poland for the first time uh, about 10 years ago. And um, it was the week that um, they were excavating, the community was excavating for uh, a residential building. And they found human remains. They realized they were in a Jewish cemetery. Wow. Um, and we went to the mayor's office and uh, wanted more details. And we found that my grandmother was buried in that cemetery before the war. Uh, I thought, this is great news. I can call my dad. And you know, my dad was alive. So this had to be, uh, this had to be uh, uh, 12, 13 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Uh, and um, my dad said, "No, I don't. You, don't want you to do that." Uh, Why? I have no good memories of. You Poland. wanted to forget that life. Uh, do it in Israel. And my wife and I have a different pocket for Israel that that would have nothing to do with what we would do in Poland. Uh, and I respected his desire. And um, uh, on his deathbed, I, I didn't do anything, but I knew I would after he would pass. I had to because if I didn't do it, it was uh, it was gone. It was locked out of history. Nobody would ever you know go back and 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 do this. And on his deathbed, I told him that we we were the family was doing this, and he gave me his best wishes and said it's okay. I understand, which was great. So this year we finally finished it, um, and we dedicated in this little community uh, of five or six thousand people in Poland, um, and uh, we um, we recognized uh, a family that had hidden eight of my family members uh, for two years. <coughs> And uh, they're in Yad Vashem. Yeah. They, uh, they happen to be in Yad Vashem. And then we're creating a, a fund right now uh, that uh, internally uh, that will uh, give scholarships to um, children in that community that uh, want to go to a fashion school and um, we'll give them a job post graduation for a year, and then we they have to go back to Poland. And the reason was, um, you look at one survivor um, who lived in that community, and because he survived, there are oh, about maybe two hundred thousand people in the world that have work 
um, and we we want to send that message back to to that community. So we'll, and that survivor's your dad. Yeah, that's so powerful. Why do you think Jews have become entrepreneurs at the rate that we have been? I mean, we are disproportionately entrepreneurial. We are disproportionately in business relative to, again, 15 million the Jews, us, yeah. tiny, tiny, tiny group of humans on the planet, yet the connection with entrepreneurship is so obvious. Why is that? I, I, I guess it's all, you know, it goes well beyond you know, our existence, well, you know, well before, you know, whether it's, you know, the Rothschilds that loaned money and traded um, or, you know, uh, or just the the farmer that brought his crops to market, or um, not sure it's it's existence. You know, it, it's one can't say that entrepreneurs almost sounds a little bit like schmatas, um, but you can go so much broader and 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 hit the the intellectuals of the world. Right. Medicine, twenty five percent of noble. noble uh, prize winners are Jews. So that, that you know, we're well balanced. We, we know how to survive. Uh, and we know how to think and we know how to contribute and we care about, we care about people. We care about you know, humanity, its existence, and we're curious. We're, you know, we're a curious breed of people. Yeah. It goes back to that, you know, that one line in, in your dad's book, which is um, the survivor's instinct, which I think is so powerful. Um, Morris, thank you for sitting down with us. This has been incredible. Thank you. Morris, really I have to it. tell you, you know, Harley often says we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and, and we're both aspiring, uh, we're entrepreneurs, but aspiring to do more and more. You guys have done contribute. amazing. Yeah, yeah, you amazing. know, without even knowing it, you've inspired us. I'm sure you're going to inspire so many people with this episode. And we just want to say thank you. I love the fact that you guys are doing this. The, there is no, no financial gain. It's, uh, it's, it's You're fun. obviously incredibly busy and taking the time to to leave a, a, a piece of history um, which some might deem important history behind is is great. We but, think it's critical to archive stories like yours. That's great. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Started from the bottom, now we're here.